Politics. The Civic Design Center is a not-for-profit, non-governmental agency, and the financial support of our members and contributors make it possible for us to invite fabulous speakers, as well as to visualize, promote, and facilitate the implementation of best practices that benefit both our residents and our visitors. Thank you for attending, and thank you for your financial support. Now I'd like to introduce the National Civic Design Center's Design Director, Gary Gaston. Thank you, Julia, and uh, thank you all for coming out to this uh, very exciting event tonight. I'm happy to be here, and I know you all are. Um, I just want to, uh, to introduce the uh, Audible Lecture Series, and uh, that's Audible. The first three words are AUD, which stands for Architecture Urban Design. And uh, we are really thrilled that this is the kickoff uh, lecture in that it is a series that is made possible by a very generous grant from the Scott C. Chambers uh, Fund through uh, his foundation. So thank you, Scott, very much. Appreciate it. The inspiration for Audible series comes from a great man who is not here with us tonight, Stephen McGredman. Stephen launched the Nashville Cultural Arts Project's Out of Sight series in 2001, and over several years introduced Nashvilleians to the current and future superstars of architecture, arts, and design world. Stephen understood the impact these outside voices could have in shaping Nashville into a city that held design in highest esteem. But also in his brilliance and charm, he managed to sell the excitement of our city, and specifically this space, Newhoff, to everyone he invited to come speak. Right, Greg? Uh, Stephen was a visionary member of our Nashville community who, while celebrating the city's historical assets, recognized and encouraged the breadth of its creative potential at his every opportunity. Both as an individual and through projects like NCAP and Out of Sight, and to support of the Nashville Civic Design Center, Stephen gave himself wholeheartedly to the betterment of Nashville. Through this series, the Civic Design Center and Scott Chambers Fund wish to recognize and help carry on Stephen's wonderful spirit. I would also like to recognize several other people tonight who helped make this event possible and continue to, uh, to be involved with the work here, uh, making Newhoff uh, a real asset for the city of Nashville. Anita Sheridan, Matthew Cushing, Linda McGregman Orsai, and Mel Chan and Helen. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you so much for having us. I think it is very appropriate that our first speaker in this series is Greg Pascarelli. Uh, I, was, uh, I was here and I remember very well 10 years ago last month, uh, 2003 in March, when he came and spoke for the first time. I sat right over there. And uh, through all the lectures that I attended in the Out of Sight, uh, I was completely enthralled with the speakers and the vision for bringing those speakers here to Nashville and the inspiration that they created when they came here. And I have to tell you, they did inspire people here. They inspired me, and it was something that I decided I wanted to stay in Nashville and contribute to the city because I saw the energy and excitement that could happen here. So, Greg, it's wonderful to have you back to be our uh, kickoff speaker for this. There, uh, we pulled a model out of the office in the back of one of the buildings that you played a role in helping design here, which uh, hopefully will, will be constructed someday soon. And uh, I just want to give a brief introduction for Greg. Uh, Greg received his Master of Architecture from Columbia University. He co-founded Shop Architects in 1996 and has lectured, exhibited, and been published internationally ever since, and most recently in the copy of Metropolis I just got in the mail a few weeks ago. As both Practitioners and educators, Shop's commitment to challenging the entire process of building has made a convincing argument to a generation of architects that beauty and technological proficiency are not mutually exclusive. Shop recently published their monograph titled Out of Practice in 2011, which is also the title of your talk tonight. So uh, please help me give a big national welcome to Greg Pasquale. Very, very much. Um, it's amazing to be back here in Nashville. Um, I'm not a superstitious guy, but I actually, my lucky number is 13. I don't know why, it just is. And uh, I was looking at the poster and I gave my first talk here on March 13th, 2003. 
and uh, it's 2013 now, 10 years later, and um, I feel like I was incredibly lucky that day because I got to meet everyone here from the McRedmond family, um, Helen and Mel, who brought me here, and uh, the way that they've opened up their arms over the years have just been amazing, and I miss Stephen very much. I gotta talk about architecture. <laughs> so, um, Shop uh, is the name of our firm. It originally started with the names Sharpless, Holden, Pascarelli. And uh, another thing that's really wonderful about tonight is that um, I do lecture quite a bit all over the world, but very rarely do I get my partner, uh, both my partner in my office, but also my incredible wife, Kim Holden, is here tonight, who is the H in Shop. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, um, there were three names, but there were five founding partners, and that's because the partnership was made up of two husbands and wives, and the identical twin brother of one of the husbands. <laughs> so this confuses everybody, so we made this chart to explain to our clients. <laughs> And um, all five of us went to Columbia. Um, the four of us were in the graduating class of 94. Chris was in the class of 1990. If you're inside these green boxes, you're married and share things like bank accounts. And if you're inside this blue ellipse, you're identical twins and you share things like genetic code. So, um, uh, the firm was founded in 1996, and um, you know we just started by trying to rethink what architecture practice could be. Um, and I think one of the most important things about the the drawing here is that you'll see there are, we all came from other professions. We all had other careers before we went into architecture. Not to say that that's a good or bad thing, but I think what it did was really allow us to. Um, freely adapt other methods of problem solving from other industries and endeavors and try and bring them into to, to the practice of design and architecture. And, and in our staff, we really also try to find people with as varied backgrounds as possible. And it's really about making a kind of think tank, a kind of place where we can break the rules freely and try and reinvent the rules in the pursuit of making better space, better cities, and a more sustainable world. Um, in 2007, we added a sixth partner, John Malley, who runs a firm called Shop Construction. We had spent a decade really using the absolute cutting edge technologies for, for fabrication and manufacturing and building of buildings and created a separate company um, that, that does that. And then in um, 2012, um, I finally found my twin, um, who is Vishan Chakrabarty, and you can tell that because we both have 11 letters in our last name that end in I. <laughs> um, Vishan is a, an, an urbanist, he's the head of the real estate development program at Columbia and actually has a new book that literally as we got on the plane yesterday to come to Nashville came from the presses uh, called The Country of Cities that will be out um, in May that I really highly suggest you all read. It is a groundbreaking uh, piece of work about what the future of the United States is politically and why cities are the reason it's going to be solved, the, the way to solve a lot of the problems. Um, with that said, this is our sort of diagram of the sort of last 150 year history of pra the practice of architecture. And one of the things that really sort of got at us early on was this division that really happened starting about 30 years ago where, and when we were in school, our professors actually said things to us like, hey, you guys are great designers, like, so are you gonna, you know, are you going to enter competitions and do really cool buildings and win them and do this kind of stuff and have a boutique firm? Or are you going to start a practice that knows how to build and your buildings don't leak and you can do corporate kind of projects all over? And we looked at them like, why would that be a choice? Like, why can't we do both? And um, that was a radical idea 20 years ago. I think it started to change and I'd like to think that we had something to do with that. I think we also, I think because we came from other fields that this sort of cycle of stylistic consumption, this, this idea of the, what we call the battle of the isms, this, 
you know, there's a theory, there's, there's um, some text written, there's an aesthetic attached to it, it gets a show at MoMA, three buildings get built, they're derided, and then the next one comes into fashion. It's just sort of not what we were really terribly interested in. We really think of architecture as a game that's 100 years, 200 years, 300 years long. And, and this, if we wanted to do that, we would have gone into fashion. Maybe that would have been more fun. But um, I think that what brought us together, the five of us together in the beginning was this idea, in, in Robert Venturi's words, of, of a both-and firm. Obviously using it in a very different way than Venturi did. But that you could teach, you could research, you could think about design and culture and what that means. At the same time, really sort of heavily engaging in technology, finance, real estate, politics, um, um, construction, city planning, city building, infrastructure, and that these things could come together to really start to make a bigger difference in the way one thinks about how a building gets designed and built. So it was that that brought us together rather than, let's say, a shared aesthetic, which I think is the way most partnerships in art architecture come together. And so it was this notion of an idea of performance-based design, that if we wanted buildings that could do both of those things, they had to perform well, it wasn't necessarily what they looked like that mattered. And we looked at the aerospace industry, the automotive industry, we looked into nature, and we saw many, many examples of performance-based design and started to break apart what those relationships between form and performance might be. And this is just about the time that the computers are now getting sort of fast enough and cheap enough that we could really begin to simulate a lot of these relationships and um, um, digitally, where one could start to make thousands of iterations of different forces um, coming together in a space and seeing what kinds of forms would emerge as a building was became a sort of performance object. Now, what was happening, obviously, was that a lot of the forms that were coming out were complex curvature surface models. And we looked at the history of those in architecture, and of course it's a long one from the cathedrals to, to, to huts or tents or anything. But you know, obviously in the sort of previous 5,000 years of history, all of that complex curvature was executed through labor. The fact that you, know, you had 10,000 guys on the job site at a penny a day uh, to chop up that stone into those curvatures was a very different thing from what we could do today, where it had to be sort of objects that get purchased and assembled on a site. Um, but that was really where the sort of core of how we started to think about the relationship between foreign performance and building started. And we looked at every time that there was a sort of um, paradigm shift in technology or a paradigm shift in the kinds of materials that could be used and the way that those were used, the way that they were assembled, the kinds of breakthroughs that they did, the kinds of um, ornament and form and relationship that would emerge from that new technology. And we, again, we saw it in architecture, we saw it in aerospace. And th those became our heroes for how we started to think about how to design and build. Now, it constantly came, though, back to not only drawing this stuff so that we could see what it could be and what it could look like, but also inventing drawings that taught us how to put it together. That if you only invested your time in the aesthetic of the building, without thinking about every single step of the way of assembling the building, because at the end of the day, architects don't really build buildings. We make instruction sets for other people to build buildings. And so that we felt that it was equally important to think about every step of that instruction set to, to parse out the complexities in a way that, that, um, that's, that people making the parts and in the field putting it together could understand as a way to sort of push architecture forward as a theoretical premise. So as we kept going through these, what we started to find out was that the sort of standard ideas of plan, section, and elevation, the three methods in which architects really talk, were starting to become obsolete. That if we were starting to engage these new emerging technologies, the way in which computers could not only help us draw, but actually make objects, that those, that sort of abstract system of, of, of representation was really begin, becoming very limited. And we had to almost rethink what the new kind of drawing for the next generation of buildings would be. Um, so one drawing that we don't like is this one. And this is, this, is, um, this is one of the only drawings in the AIA documents. Okay. This is, and Richard, you're going to be OK with this. This is a drawing not made by architects. This is a drawing made by lawyers who want to make sure that they have work for the rest of their lives. This is a drawing 
that creates animosity on the job site in the production of space. This is about setting up people who are gonna say who they can blame when something goes wrong, not about how you come together to figure out how to solve a problem. And so I wanna talk about our work through the way in which Shop has tried to address this diagram. Because this is the standard mode of business today and we don't think it's the right one for any of, any of the three people uh, set up here. So very early on, we started to think about our consultants and how you bring them into the design process. Now, I'm not just talking about having your structural or your mechanical engineer involved from day one, but like going all the way down to every single person who's gonna be involved in making the building and asking them questions about how they like to do it and don't like to do it. So for example, if you're gonna build a building with using metal panel, don't talk to the engineer, or don't just work in your office making beautiful objects of metal panels, Figure out like how big the metal, where, what's the coil that they come off of? How many come in a box? How heavy are they? What are the 10 ways I can fold it? What's the diameter of the curve when, what are the 10 ways I can clip the two together? Which ones do you like doing? Which ones do you not like doing? How can I work that material? And start using those kinds of ideas before you ever put pen to paper or mouse to screen and start to draw. So some examples of that very early work go all the way back to our project at PS1, um, which was the first, um, the first time one of the Young Architects Prize that, that the Museum of Modern Art and PS1 gives out. This was the one that we won in 2000. And the program here was to do an urban beach. So we said, well, performatively, if it's a performative architecture, what does that mean? What is an urban beach? So we said, if you had shading areas, places to change, places to sit, places to dance, and places to get wet, you would, whether you had sand and water, you would in fact have a beach. So we took a series of surfaces and mutated those surfaces along their edge so that every one of those programs could unfold along the surface of the structure itself. Um, we then made a what's basically a BIM version 0.1 model, a full model of a kind of ABAB system of sticks. The A's are in red, the B's are in blue, the purple is where they come, over, come across each other. The dimensions are all taken from mins and maxes of every part of a human body, which was meant to allow those pieces to, the, the, the programs to have interaction between different people. We created a set of, this is the set of construction documents themselves. So these drawings, each drawing is 15 feet high by 32 feet long, full scale template that went onto a platform. You followed the colors, you put the two pieces of sticks next to each other, hit it with a stainless steel screw, trimmed the two edges, moved on to the next piece. And all the Z coordinates and location of all the systems are done in these text elements here. The building then went together in three, we had three weeks to design it and three weeks to build it. And um, we put it together and here you can see the structure as it was finished. One of the other elements we did was this forest of trees with high pressure mister heads on the top so that every 20 minutes while you were sitting there in the sun, the entire courtyard of the museum would fill with the spray of the ocean, if you will, hit the cedar, release this amazing smell. Water was pumped up to the roof and came down in a waterfall. There were changing areas. There were um, um, places where you could see the kind of smooth transition from a seat to a wall. And then your typical day at Dunescape, um, out, out at, um, out at PS1 in, in Long Island City. So it was a, it was a smashing success. Um, it was really very exciting for us. It was really the first big, we got probably 60 or 70 articles, multiple television appearances, all kinds of things were happening with this. And you know, the funny thing was the year before we won it, an architect who you may have heard of named Philip Johnson had done the installation at PS1 that previous year. And then they asked, they decided that they wanted to make this about something for younger architects to do more experimental work. So at the end of the summer, I, I asked the director of the museum, Alana Heiss, I said, so how, how did it, how'd you guys do this summer? She said, it was great, we got 8,000 people every weekend to come out to the, they, they hold a, basically a, a, a DJ party where they fly DJs in from around the world and everyone comes and hangs out on the architecture and it's a big party. So, uh, she said, we got 8,000 people a weekend. I said, well, how many people did you get last year? And she said, well, we had 2,000 people a weekend. 
and I said, huh, that's interesting. So 6,000 additional people times 12 weekends at $10 admission a head, plus an average of two beers and one hot dog. I was like, we just generated a million dollars in revenue for the museum, and our fee was $15,000. <laughs> What's wrong with architecture? <laughs> but some amazing things did happen from that. Um, um, Virgin came out to see it and um, then commissioned us to do uh, a building for them in New York at JFK, where we were able to sort of almost create a building within a building inside the terminal, all completely fabricated by the computer, pre-assembled and brought together, um, to an arts complex outside of um, um, Seoul, Korea, um, and the, um, Hangul Sa was the book publisher and art publisher where we did a, it's, it's a whole series of programs. You actually enter the building off the hill, go through a series of ramps around a three-story high book wall uh, where they sell their art books and then there's a restaurant and exhibition space to a building here in, in uh, Newhoff. So, <laughs> remember that. So, um, you know, having, having met um, Mel and Helen out at the, um, we, I think we were slumming it in Aspen, right, Mel? Yeah, so, um, and Mel said, you know, you've got to come to Nashville. You've got to meet these people. You've got to see this site. There's, there's something really special here. And it was an amazing part of our lives and the lives of shop. But to start to rethink about this campus, making a kind of piazza here, thinking about a mixture of offices and restaurants and, and a kind of incubator space. Uh, I think actually the restaurant was up on this level. And then um, an early idea of prefabricated housing inserting into a large bar on top, which I will then come back to towards the end of the lecture. Um, but yeah, you can see the way that we were thinking about reusing the pen, um, really thinking about starting everything here at Newhoff in this amazing space opening up and then and then thinking about how it would grow over the years. Um, and then this was the idea that these pieces could be fabricated in a factory, so it would be like a combination of kitchen, bathroom, bedroom unit that would drop inside the sort of frame. So sort of being inspired by the frame of the holding pen, building a new one on top that sort of completed the, the enclosure of the piazza, and then having every single apartment have a view, that view right there of downtown. Um, to a competition that we did for the Fashion Institute of Technology, where we tried to rethink what a design school would be. Um, we thought like the performance of design school is exhibiting your work, critiquing your work, circulating your ideas. So we literally took the 20 feet of the facade of the thickness of the building and created all the circulation, all the exhibition spaces, and all the critique rooms were literally embedded in the facade of the building itself. So this is 28th Street looking east in Manhattan. So as you walk down the street, these are the existing buildings of the university. The, the actual act of design school, of learning how to design, would be in the facade of the building and demonstrated to the city as a whole. They're still raising the money for that one. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, as we, but you know, to do a kind of shape and form, and we were starting to really think about how one builds a building like this. And it's incredibly, it's incredibly complicated, but if you can really think about how you use the tools, how you can use the digital to push the realm of what design can be, because a computer doesn't care if it cuts out a thousand of the same shape or a thousand different shapes, but how to do that, how to organize it, really became something that we realized we had to master if we were ever gonna get buildings like that built. So we realized that we had to start to get more and more involved in the construction side of things if we didn't want our buildings to get value engineered constantly. And the first time we did that, I think, was at a competition that we won out in Greenport, New York, where we did a four-acre park with a series of different elements. The centerpiece is a carousel house. They had an antique carousel. There's a harbor walk, an amphitheater, a marina, a ferry terminal, and then last playing fields. Um, this is a, a water garden that turns into a skating rink in the winter. And then lastly, this little piece, which is a folly that, the, um, that I'll talk about in a second. But um, again, getting very involved in uh, the remediation of the soil, in helping the construction manager build this. To, this was the, the carousel house with these large scale, two ton, 16 feet by 16 feet bifold doors that are on worm drives, where the building actually responds to the microclimate on the park itself. So the doors, will shut down relative to where the wind is coming off of the water. 
to the, um, the ferry terminal that we designed, and then to this folly. And so the mayor of the town, David Capel, um, said to us, um, you know, I'd like a camera obscura in this park. And so we said, oh, okay, we'll do a camera obscura. And I think after six years of building all those other buildings for him, we said, could we really just use this little building as a pure research project? And he said, totally, you know, I, I have faith in you guys. So what we did was we took all the programmatic requirements of the camera and we positioned them in a way to make a minimum surface object that could literally encaps and enable every one of those programs to occur. Um, the camera had, um, was a version with a mirror in it, so it looked at all the other buildings in the park and, and reflected it down onto a table uh, in the middle of the dark room itself. And so then what we did was we, we literally wrote our own programs to help generate these forms. We got the forms that we wanted, and then we manually modeled all 2,800 parts that go into this building. No two were alike. And we made a set of construction documents where you could actually see every material is indexed where it is in space in the building itself. And these are the, these are the construction documents. So you either have drawings that tell the computer how to make the parts, or you have drawings that every single part arrives on site, pre-cut, pre-slotted, pre-numbered, ready to pop together like the most kick-ass piece of IKEA furniture you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> And so these, what was fascinating was we, 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 I mean, we were even able to weigh when you knew what kind of composite pieces were together, how much that would weigh. So we never made any part heavier than what two workers could lift. So there was no need for any specialized equipment on the site. And just by thinking through all of these things at every step, none of the design was taken away from us. So, um, you know, here it is, you know, fold, weld, bolt, screw. Those are the instructions right there. And these are the drawings. There's not, this is not a, this is not a uh, presentation drawing. This is what the, the set that got stamped by the city looked like. And the fascinating thing was we finished this, it's about a 30 page set, it's not, not a big set at all. We finished the drawing set and we got it approved and then we looked at it and said, wow, there are no dimensions on any drawing in this set because dimensions are now totally irrelevant. Because the building, the, the, the instruction set is now telling the computer how to make every single part and you don't need to know how big anything is because it just goes together and it is the size that it is. The contractors did not carry tapes on their belts and if you ever heard a saw go off on the site, people would run out and just say stop, stop because you knew there was nothing that ever needed to be cut. So um, this was actually a piece we did for the Cooper Hewitt's Triennial. Those are all 2,800 parts. It was actually made from the same files that we built the building from, just printed at 1 20th the size. Even the uh, formwork for the, for the foundation was all milled, and all they had to do was shoot four locations from the surveyor, and it fully templated out with instructions milled into the wood saying, dig here, dig here six feet down. They never had to look at the drawings. They just followed numbers <coughs> and put the building together. So <clears throat> three guys put it together in six weeks. Every part fit. And um, this is what it looked like when it was done. And it was remarkable um, to us because, you know, we would never argue that you would build a 60-story building this way. But what we started to see was that you can now take certain parts of the architecture and just rethink the way that you make that instruction set. You can make 90% of your building completely standard and take 10% of your building and make it like this, and it looks like the entire building became this incredibly complex masterpiece. And so it became a really sort of, but the other thing that was so interesting on this, the four bids, this was a public park, so it was a public bidding process. The four bids came in within one and a half percent of each other because all the risk was removed from the contractor side of, of things because they knew exactly how many pieces, exactly how long it would take to go through. They could see how it would go together. There was no more guessing. So suddenly, this kind of hardcore reach into technology gave us complete freedom on design. And we said, this is probably a good thing. We should keep doing this a little bit. Um, and, and the more we started learning, we learned this is exactly how aer aerospace works, right? So we were looking at Boeing. We were looking at the way things were being made. And it's, it's, it's the same way. So how do we start to bring that knowledge down to buildings because it's ridiculous. The way we make buildings is like the way we made a 54 Buick. I mean, they're death traps, right? And we've got to really start to think about 
doing it in a much smarter way for the future. So the park got finished and it was a success. There you can see the little folly. Um, and it's actually really turned the entire town around. Now, not unremarkably, the, the mayor who sort of had the vision and really pushed us to do this also was the town's um, largest real estate broker. So he, um, he did very well in the five years after the park opened. Um, but then that led us to another project where um, uh, to compete for a park in Manhattan, a two-mile Esplanade Park uh, in Lower Manhattan. Now the fascinating thing was, in order to be qualified to do this park, you had to have done a waterfront park in the state of New York, which we so luckily just happened to have finished that one in Greenport. So we were suddenly competing against uh, some of the top firms in the world, and um, we won the competition to think about it. So. The idea was to take from the Battery through the um, Wall Street, South Street Seaport, Lower East Side, this is the Manhattan Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge, to think about how to reconnect this sort of two mile waterfront. This is what it looked like um, six or seven years ago. So you had these major infrastructure pieces with tunnel entrances. I mean, what's remarkable is this is some of the only truly south facing waterfront property in Manhattan less than a five minute walk from the third largest central business district in North America. And yet, <clears throat> this is what it was being used for. To dump garbage, salt piles. Here, here's where thousands, tens of thousands of people live without any access, very little access to parks. And we found places where there were 14 layers of chain link fence between where people lived and where they could get to some open space. So, the way that we thought about, the next thing that we did was we were thinking about what are the typologies of waterfronts around the city of New York. So we leased a helicopter, a photography helicopter, we hung out the side and we had them fly us over 340 miles of waterfront property, waterfront elements in New York to make a taxonomy of the way in which the city needs the water. So we came up with all these different types, but for the lower uh, East River area, there was, there was one sort of system that we started to see that we could take advantage of. Now, the, the current configuration is there's, there's um, Water Street, which is kind of a large boulevard, uh, Front Street, which is a sort of service street to these towers, and then South Street, which basically had truck parking underneath, an elevated highway, the FDR Drive, running right through the middle of it, layers of fence, and whenever you were lucky enough to get a pier, there was usually an abandoned shed on it, just to make sure you couldn't see the water at all. So um, we studied everything about it. And the fascinating thing that we found was that the, the number one reason that people weren't getting out there, um, even in the places where there wasn't a shed, was the distance between the curb here and here, which varied between 120 and 160 feet under a dark highway with no signals, and people were just afraid to get, to get across there. So we said to the city, look, get rid of the parking under the FDR Drive, wherever you can, plant a tree, get the bike lane going all the way through so it gets the whole circuitous bike route around Manhattan. And then instead of complaining, at first we looked at taking down the highway like they did in San Francisco uh, with the Embarcadero. There were many, mostly political reasons why we couldn't do it, some, some actually smart planning reasons. But instead of complaining about that, we said, hey, let's think of it as a free roof. And if we have this free roof above us, let's hang lightweight walls that are inexpensive off of it, and let's start creating program space where you now start bringing the city out to the waterfront. Why can't we start making cultural spaces? Why can't we make um, uh, community spaces? Why can't we have recreation spaces? And, and get these kinds of elements along there so you have a new type of park where the sort of action and activity of the city is something that's actually on display. So the, uh, the last part of the idea was then also you can't expand this, the footprint of the piers um, because of environmental issues, so we, but, but we're desperate for space down there. So we said, well, why don't we start making double-decker piers? So you get sort of two for one of open space for every foot of river that you're casting shadow over. So we said, you know, you can have sort of marine uses and, and uh, revenue generating programmatic uses underneath it, and you can have sort of um, uh, more passive recreation on the upper levels. So they thought we were insane, but um, gave us the contract anyway, and we spent the next eight years uh, working on this project. So the first phase opened about a year and a half ago, that's about the first third of a mile, 
Um, we developed our own system of, of um, park furniture. It was all made with ductile concrete. It's a kind of system of boxes and benches that come together. We put a series of precast uh, concrete walls that run along um, the rivers, parallel with the river's edge, where we were able to build up the soil enough. A lot of this is platform over the river so that we could get trees in it. Um, this is now looking out, so we, we got, we measured how far the sun angles would come in, we got the plantings in as far under the FDR drive as we could. And now, you know, what you saw that was a park truck and a garbage pile, this is almost the same exact spot where it is today. Um, so then you can see the railing goes in and out. And one of my, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves of going down to a waterfront is you go onto a waterfront and you sit in a chair and the regulated 42 inch high handrail is exactly where your eyes want to look out on the water. So we spent three years arguing with the city of New York that all stools along the waterfront needed to be bar stools and needed to be up high. And, um, and so here you see them. And, and the, the railing itself goes from six inches wide to 18 inches wide. You, people go out there, they flip open their laptops, they open the newspaper, they, they eat lunch. They are the most popular um, chairs in the, in the park at all time. And now the city is adapting this as a, as a primary way to design all their waterfront seating around the entire island of Manhattan. It's awesome to sit up there. Um, and then uh, one of the other things we had a long battle with the city over was um, uh, we wanted them to paint this main girder of the FDR Drive lavender. Um, so that took four years to get, to get through. Um, 60 different shades of lavender were studied. Um, but the idea in the park, like one of the great things about going to a waterfront, I especially, well, I love going to the water at night, and the way that the light levels drop, and the boats are out on the water, and there's the twinkling, and it just, everything changes, especially when you're in the city, and you've got to try and find those moments where you can get out of there. And, and one of the things is like, you know, in a lot of parks you have these big bright lights or these light posts, and whether they're modern or, or, or neo-historicist, they become these objects that you look at. So one of the main design elements in this park was that every light was hidden, and you could only see the light if it bounced off another surface. So what we did was we put all the lights hidden up inside the FDR drive, and they hit the lavender, and then you can see the sort of glow of lavender on here, or the lights are inside these precast concrete walls, or they're inside the railing, so that you never can actually see a light, but you feel completely safe. And in fact, the lavender glow that comes out here makes anyone you're on a date with out there look phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, you can't get off this waterfront without kissing whoever you're with. <laughs> it works. Um, and then on our pier, we did this double-decker pier, where you see this kind of um, wing. We've got, this is we, we, we sort of jokingly refer to this as the Lido deck, where um, all the benches are at exact due south uh, for prime tanning angles. Um, you can see we made these series of glass boxes that hold maritime education centers and um, cafes. Um, that have green roofs on top of them that hold up the upper level of the deck. We got planting out here as much as we could. And this is being on, so here you can see the glass goes right through and the green roof becomes a lawn that you can picnic on on the upper part of the deck. This is the view out towards the harbor, there's Governor's Island. And this is literally invented space in New York. So this is, and by the way, you know, dirt in New York City, which probably costs somewhere around $10,000 a foot to $15,000 a foot for dirt, $175 a foot we produce park space. So, you know, just trying, by being smart and using it, the additional cost for building that upper level created another 60,000 feet of park space for almost no money um, for the city. And you can see this was what it's used uh, like every day. Places where you can get really close to the water, um, it was all designed to be flooded, so we designed everything that it could, the water could go right through. So Sandy went through, nothing was damaged, not a single thing. Water went right through, came right out, we opened everything up. It was designed to do that. We, I think we lost two plants. The whole thing. And then the biggest, the biggest criticism we had from the city was, well, who wants to be in a park with a giant thing over your head? We said, well, just make the thing great. And so we, we took these series of recycled uh, materials that we, we got colored into a red and put lights up behind it and it becomes this incredible 
glowing red tuna belly floating above your head as you go out onto the park surface. And what it looks like as you're walking up the Esplanade tonight. That's not a rendering, that's, that's the real thing as it's finished. Um, so this opened last June, I think, Kim? Right. And uh, it's, been, it's, been, uh, it's been remarkably successful and actually not very expensive at all to build. So doing a public project, so here's our Pier 15 and this is our Esplanade. There was a, um, a large development done by the Rouse Corporation called the South Street Seaport, which was done in the 80s, which has been uh, kind of a failure financially. Um, and the private developer who has a lease with the city on that property for another 75 years loved what we were doing on the park. So he asked us, what would you do if you could knock down the pier and rethink the whole South Street Seaport? So in 2007 and 2008, we developed this plan where we were putting a four acre park out on the pier. We knocked down the existing building and the idea was to have a series of retail buildings and move all the FAR from the pier into one tall slender building here that the idea was you'd have again retail, a historic um, um, market building that would return to a food use kind of like the ferry building in San Francisco, boutique hotel here, luxury hotel here and housing above all clad in this exoskeleton that would be um, uh, steel clad in terracotta. Um, so it was an amazing project that we got about 80% of the way through the approvals process, highly contentious, um, when the crash hit. And our client was a firm called General Growth Properties. Um, we were the second largest mall owner in the United States, $66 billion market cap, went bankrupt in three months largest bankruptcy in the history of American real estate. Now, it was not that their underlying business was a problem, they were actually making money through the whole thing, it was that they had um, gone on a buying spree in the early 2000s um, with 12 billion of debt that needed to be refinanced in 2008. That took the company down. So they've actually re-emerged from bankruptcy, um, and then they split the company in half and actually now there's a company called the Howard Hughes Corporation, which took over all their development sites, and they've come back and hired us again, and we're working on completely rethinking the whole project, but we just got the first piece of it um, through uh, Landmarks approval, so it's this whole idea of a kind of um, larger um, cultural building above that's clad in this sort of highly articulated glass with a sort of retail, uh, open streets and villages below with large glass um, pier doors that drop up and down and literally cutting into the pier so boats can pull right into the areas where there's sort of the retail and restaurants and uh, the kind of views of Brooklyn and the Brooklyn Bridge. And working then with the city, we got to meet our mayor and our mayor liked the work that we were doing very much and he asked us to be, um, he hired five firms, it's remarkable, I guess it's good when your business is doing very well. Um, he hired five firms to go all the way through schematic design on his headquarters for London. Um, so it was us, Tom Main, Diller Scafidio, London's KPF, and Norman Foster. And um, so we worked on this project for four months, I'm sorry, six months. Um, and then they cut the list to two, it came down to us and Norman Foster. But it was a really fascinating project where we rethought what the office could be, this idea of a kind of connection to the street and a connection to the monuments that you could see in London. There's a lot of things in here that are about the way Bloomberg, uh, uh, their offices run and their canteens and the way in which meetings are held and, and how they broadcast around the world. Um, but a really tricky project because you have all these um, preserved view corridors of St. Paul's, and this is a block and a half from St. Paul's, so how do you build a, a kind of skyline building, a signature building, but not violate the, the, the view quarters? So this was the view of the building from the Tate Modern's uh, terrace. And uh, we got all the way down to the end, and we thought we had it won, and then we found out that um, Norman Foster was doing it, um, which was a bummer. Uh, but I guess it's no shame to lose to Norman Foster in London. So um, it was, but it was an amazing project that we worked on for nine months. Now, what we started to realize was that a lot of the things that we were doing now for our clients was almost becoming an advisor to them and how they were running their business as much as how much, how we were designing space for them. Um, 
And at the same time, we realized that if we wanted to get some of these buildings done, that we were making a lot of money for our clients, so should we just joint venture with them if they wanted to unlock some of this technological ability? So the first time we did that was a building called the Porter House, which is in the Meatpacking District of New York, where there was a six-story warehouse building, and there were, let's just say, 10 developers chasing that property. Now, the FAR on the site was only six stories, so it was built out full, um, but there were two three-story buildings to the south, and so our first inclination was to try and buy those air rights and transfer them on top of our uh -huh. building. And now there's a height limit of 120 feet in the building, and there was a 15-foot setback, so there was only a limited amount that we could buy. But the idea was, and, and a lot of people had that idea as well, but we figured like if this was a smart building and it would generate revenue, if we could just get the building a little bit bigger, that would give us just a little bit more money that we could outbid the other guys. So we started thinking about buying an air and light easement over the buildings next to us, and so the only way we could expand the building was by going horizontally out across our neighbors, which I think a few other people had that idea too, but eventually working with our engineers, um, from Bureau Happold, we came up with a way of sort of taking a six-story masonry building and reinforcing it and putting a six-story new glass and steel building and having a two-story couple um, that locked the two buildings together. And that allowed us to just get it out a little bit farther, which gave us a little bit more space, which gave us a little bit more projected revenue, which let us outbid all the other guys that we were trying to go for. So it was, uh, well, wait till it's done first. <laughs> so it almost fell over now. Um, and then, um, so what we did was we, 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 re we moved the core to the center and made that the kind of uh, thing that kept the building from overturning. We turn these into condominiums. Everyone has three exposures on all sides. And then we said, okay, so what is the idea of contextuality here? We said, well, the idea is that it should not look anything like the building it stands next to. So we said, let's take the material. We decided we wanted to try a metal panel building. And we said, let's, let's start to write software and think about an idea of how we could make a new kind of metal facade. Uh, for this new building that would stand in absolute contrast to this beautiful historic building. So um, we went to all the metal facade manufacturers and we said, well, how much is a zinc? We wanted to do zinc. We we're very, very much against sort of a finished material like paints and stuff. We always want materials in their natural uh, um, um, state so that they age and patina gracefully. So we wanted to do zinc and, you know, a, a, at that time, like a terrible brick cavity wall, you know, like a bad brick punched window building is like $50 a square foot. A metal building was like $58 a square foot. A really nice glass curtain wall, like at the Richard Meyer building, is about $100 to $120 a square foot. So we went to these guys, how much is a zinc building? And they said, well, it's going to be $80 to $85 a foot. And we said, why? Zinc only costs about 10% more than steel, and the material is only half of what you're doing. And they said, because we don't want to do zinc, it's a pain in the ass and we're not doing it. So <clears throat> we said, um, all right, we said, well, where does zinc come from? And they said, well, mo we buy most of it in France. So we went to France and we bought a thousand sheets of zinc that were one meter high by one, one meter wide by three meters high and brought them back to New York. And we designed the entire building so that when you unfolded the panels, you either got one, two or three panels exactly on a one by three meter sheet of raw material. And we got about 22 proto shapes, about 450 different shapes because of anomalies of the historic building versus the new building, and 4,000 total pieces of custom made zinc um, that went together to make the facade. Now this would be impossible to do, because it would be more really tough, certainly, for a, a young office. So we went, this is the first time, because you'd have to make you know, 4,000 shot drawings no pun intended, um, and so the idea here was we went to a digital, uh, sort of variable digital model of a panel type, and we fed all the differences in, in a spreadsheet, and it went directly from this spreadsheet to a laser cutter that cut out all 4,000 parts. They labeled them with a code system that you could see here. That became the instruction set for how the guys put the building together. And so we started at one corner and went all the way around. And when we got to the other side, 
right here, we were one thirty-second of an inch off with zero shop drawings at all. Not only that, we delivered the wall for $43 a square foot. And so we started to say like, okay, this is, we've got to continue to push thinking like this. And so the building went together um, and you can see it's very lucky it's won lots of awards. But one of the things that I think we love the most about it is that we're often a metal building. Sometimes it's nice to have a very taut skin, but we really wanted texture in this building to play off the kind of texture of the historic brick building that we renovated. And so you can see that we pushed all the glazing back 14 inches uh, from, the, from the outside wall. Now, that's all well and good, except what it does is it creates ledges. And in New York, we have a pigeon issue. So um, we called the Museum of Natural History and we asked them, is there actually an angle of repose that a pigeon will not land on? And they said, yes, it's 34 degrees. So literally at every window, and these are the drawings from the construction site, at every window we have a 34 degree um, piece, which is labeled, like they all have code, so it's PS, like 272, which explains where it goes, which stands for pigeon slide. And, and in fact, I've been in the building and I've seen a pigeon land and they go right off. And um, it's now almost 10 years later since this building is done, and I'm extremely proud that there's not one turd on the entire facility. <laughs> So you can see at night, these light boxes, there are two light box sizes, begin to glow. Um, we did all the collateral materials and brought it to market. We did the interiors and, and sold the 22 apartments. Um, and it was fascinating because we did this at completely standard construction cost, but we were up against, let's just say, three other architects who were building condos at the same time, and we uh, outsold them at 17% over their sales prices. So without spending one penny more, but being smart about how you did it, we were able to generate a lot of revenue for our client and also have a building that did not, and this is a really important thing. When we were doing this building, a lot of our colleagues, we were teaching, I was a professor at Columbia at the time, a lot of people said like, you know, you guys are joint venturing with the developer, like, oh my, you know, be careful, it's the slippery slope to hell, like, you know, this is, you know, you're gonna lose your street cred as like a cool designer, blah, blah, blah. And it was actually Bernard Chumi, our dean, who said, don't listen to them, go for it. You know, there are a lot of architects in history, like did you know that Adolf Loos was a huge developer and that's how he funded all his good stuff? Well, I was like, okay, so we, we gave it a shot. The fascinating thing that we learned in this was that exactly the opposite happened. As soon as our clients knew that we had as much at risk as they did, we suddenly, and that we were sitting there trying to figure out how to solve their problems rather than just say like, build my beautiful design, we got complete design freedom. Then they trusted us in a very, very different way. And so it was something that I would say like, it, again, it's this equal and opposite reaction. The more you invest in the kind of technology and the things that go behind making it, the more aesthetics and art you can actually generate and make, I believe, make better cities. So this was a, this is just a, picture I think last summer. It still looks great and um, uh, people love the building. It's very sought after and, and it's, uh, it's really been one of the things that's turned an entire uh, neighborhood around um, in New York. But that's led us to other kinds of projects at much bigger scales. This is a three million square foot project we're doing in Williamsburg. This is the Domino Sugar factory on the Williamsburg waterfront including a, a six block, this is six blocks of New York City five blocks this way and one in here. Uh, we're working on the landscape with James Corner from Field Operations, who did the High Line. We do a lot of our projects with him. And we really tried to rethink what this, what this project could be with this notion of actually making the buildings taller and more slender and running programs to prove that the taller buildings let more light into the neighbors than shorter buildings do. And the city now believes this, and it's true. And uh, we're going through the rezoning process right now. It's a, very, it's a very exciting project. So this only went public about four weeks ago. Um, I don't know how many people know Curved.com, but it's sort of the, the main uh, blog about architecture, design, real estate development. And it's, there's one for many cities around the country. Within 30 minutes, um, well, this is the view from the parks and how we're opening it up with these sky bridges, restoring the historic building into office space. But within five minutes, curbed, or 30 minutes, Curbed had re, 
uh, photoshopped uh, the image and said that we were taking over New York and that in fact this was really what our plan was. To, uh, you couldn't believe the letters from people who were like, are they really going to spell out their name in Polish? <laughs> um, but again, we, we, we started to work with clients in, in different ways. Um, this was a, a job we worked on for two years uh, with a very large um, internet search engine company in Mountain View, California, um, where they wanted us to, um, they literally said if we produced a lead platinum building, we had completely failed. They wanted two generations past lead platinum, what they called Max Green. And we, they funded research, we researched everything from like dirigible commuting from downtown San Francisco to literally we had to do computer models of would slides to bathrooms be faster than people walking downstairs and getting back up. Like they wanted, everything was about unbelievable proficiency and efficiency in the way they ran their buildings. And, and then writing our own software code to explain that in, when you're thinking about how your building works, just by prioritizing different elements, we literally had the computer generate hundreds of different options for them so that they could begin to understand the relationship between form and performance. And the building that we ended up designing for them was this amazing uh, project. This was going to be their first ground up building. Um, this is a project that also died in the crash. Of, um, this was an amphitheater so that all 5,000 of their California employees could meet together without having to build a special room. Um, everything had ramps and bicycle lanes through the entire project, uh, including special bridges that got from the founder's office where they could ride their bike to their planes uh, without having to take a car. Um, fascinating. It, there's so much about this, but it was an amazing project that we learned about. We hopefully will be doing. We ended up doing a quarter million square foot building for them um, that we're never allowed to publish or talk about. So, um, and then, but the interesting thing was, then the crash happened. And we lost six of our seven largest projects in three months. Um, we were 80 at the top. We managed to hold on to almost all of our staff. I think we were 60 at the bottom. We're over 100 now. Um, but we took a lot of the research that we did and we, we decided to enter a competition in Botswana, Africa to build a government complex. And we took the same ideas that we did about, about environment, uh, an, an environmental performance-based architecture and applied it to the Botswana um, uh, uh, context. And so again, it was this series of bars. Um, this was the competition. Um, um, drawing where we kept the trees um, from, you had to shade the parking, so we mounded up the ground, we built a sort of false ground at the first floor and left all the 150 year old trees that come through these holes and become these shading elements in the out, indoor outdoor gardens where people can meet. And then the series of bars are connected by these glass bridges that go through the treetops. Um, it's funny enough, this one came down to Norman Foster and shop again. Um, and this time we fortunately won. Um, and so this is actually under construction right now. But you know, the kind of ecotech modeling, the kind of forms that come out to literally make this building a performance envelope. Um, these are the, these are the uh, parametric models that we use to take traditional um, Botswana basket weaving techniques and turn them into the interior wall systems in all the public spaces. And we're very involved in knowledge transfer. Um, we've set up with several schools in Botswana and are teaching them the absolute cutting edge of how to use technology to actually build buildings. Here are some of the mock-ups of the computer uh, fabricated uh, wall elements and uh, what the building will look like. So it's about a 350,000 foot uh, technology center. It's the sort of centerpiece building on a three million square foot campus that is literally right in the capital as you turn out of the airport. It will be the first building you see as you welcome to, to Botswana. An amazing country, by the way. Progressive, um, smart, very little political strife, stable democracy for 45 years. They basically say it's mostly because they discovered the diamonds after they kicked the Europeans out. So, um, but here you see the building. Um, you actually literally drive right into these slots in the landscape, into the, into the parking, and it kind of floats above um, uh, the natural grasslands and the view out of the, out of the offices. 
and to the last project I'll talk about tonight, which is the Barclays Center at Atlantic Yards in downtown Brooklyn. And so for those of you who may or may not know, um, this was a uh, extremely contentious 10-year battle, probably the biggest battle in New York um, in quite a while. The, the idea was a, our, a client named Forest City Ratner um, had purchased a tremendous amount of property plus an open train yard from the MTA that was being unused, which is this kind of almost abandoned neighborhood, but surrounded by three or four fantastic neighborhoods like Park Slope and Fort Greene and Borham Hill, which have beautiful, beautiful brownstones and are neighborhoods that are really incredibly vital and where a lot of the culture in New York is, is really coming to life. Um, Bruce Ratner, the CEO, is a visionary, and his idea was that Brooklyn is still upset about losing the Dodgers to Los Angeles in 1957, and he's correct. And so what he did was he bought the New Jersey Nets basketball team, and he hired Frank Geary as his architect to master plan a new arena to bring professional sports back to Brooklyn, and then he developed six million square feet of housing around the arena on the six blocks. And six million square feet of housing is, is a lot. So um, the problem was that there was a lot of eminent domain. You're in um, a highly contentious political uh, environment there. And um, the, the, the war raged on for a long time. And eventually, there were 34 lawsuits against the project. So. Um, what happened, though, was that our client went 34-0, and 0 in, again, in those lawsuits. And then um, they eventually had to, uh, what, what happened was this design is a brilliant design that, that Frank did. It's basically four large towers like this with huge foundations that hold the bowl of the arena in the middle. And so literally what you're looking at is this was an office building and these three the this is the only part of the arena, a little bit on, on Flatbush and a little bit of Atlanta, on Atlantic Avenue that you can see. The rest of the arena is all buried inside the bases of these buildings. So um, that's a brilliant design for an urban arena as opposed to the sort of big object where I like to call the nuclear reactor in the middle of a parking lot, right? <laughs> Which just sucks the life out of a city by turning its back on everything and not having anything that's alive in the street. The problem that happened was, in 2008 and 2009, um, it was impossible to finance those four towers. So the client was left with a, a building that he had to start the design completely over. It was, a, it, was, it was a chicken without feathers or legs or a head. And so he went to Frank and said, can you redesign the arena as a standalone building? And Frank said, sure, you know, it's 18 months to two years, which is what it should take to do that kind of design. The problem was that um, the tax laws in the United States were changing. And if your building, if your arena was not in the ground by December 31st of 2009, your tax bond financing, I mean, sorry, your bond financing for the stadium was no longer tax deductible. That would have been a three to four hundred million dollar hit on the project. So this was March, and our client didn't know what to do, so he went to the largest um, uh, design build contractor of NBA arenas named Hunt Construction, and they and he said, "What do we? Is there any way I can get a stadium in the ground in, in eight months?" And they said, "It's impossible. The only hope would be that we get on our company plane, we take you to the 12 NBA arenas that we've already built, you pick out one that you like, and if it fits on the site in Brooklyn, we have the steel drawings, and we can order the steel tomorrow, and you have a shot at making it happen." So he did that, and Conseco Fieldhouse in Indianapolis was the one he liked the most. So that was Ellery Beckett, AECOM, were the architects, and was Ellery Beckett, now AECOM. And they started to do, uh, they took Conseco and they dropped it onto the site. And this is what it was, which is a very traditional sort of fieldhouse kind of brick looking building. Now, the story goes that they went in to see the mayor and the planning commissioner and everyone in the city and showed them these renderings and the city was obviously very upset because they felt they had gotten baited and switched from a Frank Geary building to, a, let's say, a more pedestrian building. And it's quite unfair what, what Ellery Beckett and AECOM went through because they were told to just do that, but that's what happened. 
So um, uh, what, what happened next was, um, you know, the next day, and no one gave any drawings out, but the next day in the New York Times on the front page, this image was there. So somehow in the meeting, one of the drawings disappeared, got to the architecture critic of the New York Times, and it was lambasted, the, the client was lambasted all over the city for, for doing this. So they were in a tough spot. Um, so a couple months later, it was actually July 4th weekend, I think it was like July 2nd or 3rd, I got a telephone call, um, and it came up and it said Bruce Ratner, who I had never met, but of course knew who he was. And I was with one of my mentors, and I just turned the phone to him, and I'm like, do I answer this? And he was like, yeah, go ahead, because I mean, I was terrified. What was he going to say? So I, 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 I answered it, and he said, this is Bruce. I said, hi. He's like, he said, do you know what my problem is? Quote. I said, I think you're talking about Atlantic Yards. He said, yes. Um, I'd like to, would you three design concepts for me? I'll be in your office on Monday morning at five, Monday afternoon at five o'clock to solve my problem. <laughs> All right, so, so my partners and I worked through the weekend and came up with three design concepts and we came into our office and we sat down, we had a great, we had a nice talk, we were like, here's design number one, we said, that, that won't work, here's design idea number two, that won't work, design number three, that won't work. We're like, why won't they work? He said, well, don't you know, I've already ordered the steel from another stadium and it's already on its way. So we got into a very long, very difficult conversation, philosophical and metaphorical about couture dressmaking and a lot of other <laughs> issues. And uh, eventually we said, well, you know, it seems like you want a skin job and we do the skin jobs and, you know, but we, it, was a, it was a three hour fabulous conversation. And at the end, his exact quote, I still tease him about it, his exact quote was, you guys are great. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you when this recession is over. We'll definitely do a building together. I'll call you in three years. And he like slapped us on the back and we we're like, all right, well, at least we have a job when the recession's over. And um, that was it. We, were, we, we said we're done. And then that night I went out with my partners and um, a couple of martinis in, we sort of had an idea. We said, you know, if we did this and that and that and we turned it and we pulled it, like there's, there's maybe one way we can make this work and we can pull enough of the steel out to make this interesting and blah, blah, blah. We called him the next morning and said, um, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna work for 72 hours. We're gonna work till Friday. We're gonna send you one image. We have one idea that we think might work. If you like it, you know, if, if you don't like it, no harm, no foul. If you like it, then we wanna do the whole thing. And he said, will you, will you, he said, you really would do that first? I said, yeah, so okay, we worked on it. So we sent it at six o'clock on Friday, and um, didn't hear anything that night, didn't hear anything Saturday, didn't hear anything Sunday. I'm like, oh, okay, so they're waiting for business hours. All right, whatever. <laughs> um, Monday comes, wait all day, no call. So by the end of the day, Monday, I'm thinking, did the damn image go through? Like maybe the, the email didn't go through. So I called uh, Bob Santa, the senior vice president of construction. I said, Bob, I was like, did you, um, did you get that email that I sent? And his quote was, if you had any idea what kind of trouble that goddamn image is causing over here, you'd have no idea. At which point I went, yes, we got the project. <laughs> so the idea was to take the vertical box and, oh, actually, this is pretty funny. This is the first sketch that we made that night on the third martini. Um, and, <laughs> Uh, I've just started to show it, but it's, it's interesting because so many of the ideas are right there, this notion of thinking about the entry from the subway, you'll see all this. The funniest part about this drawing, though, is that for some reason, Toyo Ito's name is on this paper, and none of us have any idea why we wrote Toyo Ito's name here. There's nothing about a Toyo Ito project on it at all, and, you know, it's just... It, no one has any... If anyone sees any Toyo Ito in any drawing I'm about to show, please let me know. Now, the funny thing is, as many of you, the architects in the room would certainly know, Toyo Ito just won the Pritzker Prize. So um, we're telling all the guys who are like hoping to win the Pritzker Prize that we'll put their name on our next sketch and it will be the big luck charm. We told Stephen Hall we'll, give him a, we'll, we'll put him on the next charm. So um, uh, the idea was then to completely change the building into a series of horizontal, horizontal bands and to do exactly the opposite of what every stadium does, which is turn its back on the street. And by lifting these elements and creating, aligning the concourses with the sidewalk and the streets, 
create a constant inside-outside relationship between the performance of the stadium and the performance of the city. And then in this upper band, to open up all the views to the upper concourse, have this very large entry plaza, and wherever we could, not have the retail on the concourse face into the stadium, but have it face out to the city. <coughs> Literally turn it around. So that when the game isn't on, it's still a retail speed. And then at the corners, these are the two major boulevards, and there's going to be this one-acre plaza in the front. And the idea was to make this kind of large urban gesture, these kind of uh, what we call the arms of Bernini, but make them hip-hop style, and bring them out and make this, this amazing sort of canopy. And then, of course, not wanting to be under this big, heavy element, the idea was to cut an oculus so that the light could come through, but then also when you come out of the subway, you could look right through it. So again, there was a, a major, this is a super complicated project, 11 subway lines and a train station underneath it, surrounded by two 12-lane boulevards at the busiest intersection in Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a uh, 675,000 square foot facility. So one of the ideas was to open up the whole side of the bowl of the stadium so that when you're on the plaza or in the public space, you can see right in and see the scoreboard and the bowl itself. And that the main entry of this building would be from the subway. So it's actually understood as a building from underground first. And Michael Kimmelman, the architecture critic of the time, said this is the first sports arena in America, maybe the world, that prioritizes those who come by public transportation over those who come by the automobile. And, and by the way, how many parking spots did we put for an 18,000 seat facility? Zero. Zero. No parking spots. And 95% of the people come by public transportation. You can get from Midtown Manhattan to this place in under 20 minutes. And, it's no, and one of the big arguments of the community was the traffic it was going to cause. Zero traffic. Because there are no parking spots. And the capacity has been at 97% uh, filled for every game so far this year. So what was the aesthetic? It's funny, this is the Domino Sugar Plant, three years before we knew we were going to redesign that. But this was one of our inspirations um, for Brooklyn, this notion of sort of like the decaying industry, um, but, but a city that has unbelievable technology, and this, this notion of something that's new and forward and, and, and forward thinking, but still has this rough and gritty patina around it, and that juxtaposition a sort of smooth and technology against rough and gritty was our, was our main inspiration. Now, this is the first sketch we sent on day three. So again, it's this idea of opening up the glass, opening up the view, having some kind of big cantilever element and some upper piece. We didn't know what it would be. Um, we got the job and then they said that we had seven weeks to redesign the building, detail it and cost it. This should take at least 10 months. And, um, and we had a delta of 50 million or less, and if we could bring it in under 50 million, the whole thing, delta on the price, the project would be ours on an $875 million building. So um, seven weeks later, that was the drawing. We figured out a system of ribs, five foot wide ribs, with 12,000 different shaped panels of steel, no two are alike that we proposed to be a core 10 or a rusted weathered steel um, that would become these sort of swooping elements where the openings would sort of change based on the program happening behind it, have a highly reflective glass so that there'd be the reflection of the sky off the bands when you look up at the building, and then the oculus. One of the great, I think, most interesting ideas here was that Every stadium puts the, the digital boards on the outside facing out, and we said it's exactly the opposite. You should put the billboards on the inside of the ring to create an incredible space that you look through as you come out of the subway or when you're on that public space. So all the digital boards are on the inner ring. Nothing blares out into the neighborhood. And then, the, then there's a sort of mini-me over here for the subway entrance where you come out, which we planted with a green roof. And then two and a half years later, that's the building done. So, I mean, what's, we didn't even realize this until after it was done, until probably four months after we found the drawing. We hadn't even seen it. But to get from, to get from here to here was seven weeks. We had 28 people working in two shifts, morning till night, where they were handing over the drawings 
so that we could go constantly to get it done. We got it done, we showed them that we could build it, and we got the entire design of the, of the project and, and, and worked for the next uh, one year and six months drawing and two and a half years building, so right? Maybe less. So one of the ideas was to take the steel bands and curve them into the, into the uh, uh, concourses, paint everything black on the inside and to begin to have this notion of sort of the Brooklyn street, the kind of wet street at night, and then the sort of pops of color of where you can go um, eat. So here was the idea that the ribs, these are the renderings, the ribs would come through, you would have this sort of dark gray, shiny floor, these black walls and these pops of color uh, where the concessions were. You could change materials and have different, different kinds of spaces. Um, the main entry, seeing the scoreboard and the bowl as you come right in the front. And then elements where you'd have actually uh, different bars and restaurants that would puncture right into the bowl itself. And then maybe one of my favorite things about the project also was that we told the client that we really thought every single seat in the arena should be black. And we said that sports is really theater with an unscripted ending and that we didn't want it to feel like some shopping mall or airport, that we wanted it to be about the drama of what's happening on the court, and that that court should be the only thing that you can see almost when you're in that arena, that it's purely about the drama. And we proposed using boxing lighting instead of typical NBA lighting, which is something that really sort of makes the ring pop. And um, fortunately, and we said also, if you're interested in selling any gear to New Yorkers, you can get rid of the red, white, and blue, but if it's black, they'll probably buy it. <laughs> um, so our, one of our clients is one of the owners of the team, is Jay-Z, the, the, the rap musician and, who, um, and businessman. I, I, my favorite, I don't know if my favorite quote is, uh, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, and, uh, and he said that, you know, like he was totally into it, loved it, and it, if it hadn't been for Jay-Z, we probably wouldn't have gotten through that whole thing. And I mean, the incredible tests of the colors and how the players would look and the lighting, and everything, it, was, it was amazing. Um, but then the idea at night was that the folds of the steel, the, all the lighting would be hidden behind the wall and reflect off the folded steel. But now how to get this thing built? So we literally read, wrote our own software system to help us do live changes of the forms while we were getting takeoffs. Here are the CATIA models of the 12,000 panels. Here are all the 12,000 panels unfolded. This is how they worked with sort of um, weather enclosure and backup system and the changing elements with this uh, uh, system that holds them in place. So you basically got 12,000 panels this size that made 921 mega panels which were exactly what would fit on a truck that could get into New York and could be hung up onto the building. Uh, we did shop construction, did all the fabrication tickets. We set up a factory um, where the panels would be uh, cut by computer and then hung, and they would go through 15 wet, dry cycles a day for four months to get the patina of the rust on them. You can see all the pieces, here they are drying. We wrote our own iPhone app where you could go up to any panel at any time, scan that panel, the three-dimensional model came up, you knew where the panels were in the rusting process, where they were in the fabrication process, what truck they were on, where they would be laid out at the stadium, and how they would get attached to the building. This is what would pop up and what you could see. So anyone from Bruce Ratner down to a guy with a, with a wrench in the field had the same information, completely transparent, saved tens and tens of millions of dollars on the project. Complete feedback loop from when we were building and designing to how it was coming back together. Here you see the mega panels going on the truck. Um, and then as the steel, the main steel was going up, we cloud scanned the structure, which meant we scanned the building as it was being built. And we aligned the digital model that we had done with how the building was actually getting built. And we found that 10% of the metal steel tabs where the mega panels were gonna get attached to were not in the right spot. But because we've done this six months before the panels were arriving, they could change where they all were, get them all right, it knocked three months off of the project. Also saved tens of millions of dollars. So here you can see aligning our digital model to the cloud scan model and being able to find any anomaly whatsoever before the building was even built. 
Here they are going on, being lifted into place. See so no two are alike, and they all come down, and then they all have this one foot 45 degree fold. The lights sit behind there and reflect. So in the daytime, it's a shadow, it's a dark line, and it reverses at night where those become the lit elements. Here you can see them going on. Uh, and then the, the main canopy was really a tricky piece. This is an 85 foot by 220 foot cantilever. Just to give you a sense of scale, an NBA court fits inside that oculus. So just how to, how to get this built, the sort of radically different pieces that go into this element. The scale of these, uh, you get a sense of the scale of this piece, where the piece is going on. And what was remarkable was these guys didn't want to look at drawings anymore. We were just coming up with the laptops or the iPads and showing them the digital model or, or just doing screen captures and handing them to them and they were looking at the digital model and they were putting the building together. The, like the 24 by 36 drawings, they could care less. They just wanted to see it digitally. And then here you can see when it was done with the Oculus going all the way through with the billboard. Um, Bruce has commissioned artists to do installation pieces. Mel, we've got to get you one of those. Um, here's the loading dock in the back. And then seeing the building in the Brooklyn context. So something absolutely radical and new, but somehow fits in. And, and something that people were protesting against the, the sort of core 10 steel, but now, now it's really being embraced. This is it as you're coming up Flatbush Avenue. As it turns to game time, so you can start to see the lights going on. Here's the transit hub. The main entrance going right in, you can see right into the bowl there. This is actually the 4040 Club, which is Jay-Z's sports bar up here. The retail stores that face out to the street, not in. The lights as they glow. Being under the Oculus. I, I have to say, I think my favorite thing about going to this, going to, the, to see a game, is I come up out of the subway and standing there, everyone is taking their family photograph in front of the Oculus. And they don't know what the word Oculus is. They don't know like what an 85 foot cantilever means. They're just like, this is cool. I love this. And people are smiling and laughing and embracing it. This is coming in. Now remember the, remember the renderings. So here are the main concourses. So literally, unlike any sports facility that's been done, all the restaurants are only Brooklyn local restaurants. Every ethnic group is covered. Trust me, that was a huge debate. Um, some of the bars. The game, the bowl in all black, it's just got a totally different feel. <laughs> Second quote I like the most. As a lifelong Knicks fan, I love to think about that one. Um, the VIP entry. Um, some of the bar spaces that go right into the arena. This is the vault lounge. This is the super exclusive club underneath. Um, underneath. So if you have the first, you, you get a living room, your private living room, you get access to this bar, and you get eight seats with your feet on the court, all for the low, low price of $750,000 a year. <laughs> um, here you see the bowl. And, you know, uh, what's then happened is that the next three buildings, our client was very pleased with what we did. So he said, he challenged us to see if we could make these buildings. He wanted to see if we could do modular construction for a high rise. Because this is now, this is the six million square feet of housing. So he asked us to redesign the buildings and to study if we could make these towers. This is 34, 25, and 54 stories tall. Um, to see if they could, we could invent a um, factory where the apartments could be completely built in a factory as modular steel boxes that then get stacked 34 stories tall with their cores and the brace frames in them. And they come, you build them like this with a steel box, you drop in the bathrooms, the kitchens, the walls, the floors, the lighting, the HVAC, the facade of the building. The whole thing gets shrink-wrapped, driven to the site, stacked together, bolted together, and all the connections for the HVAC are made from the corridor of the hallway. 
so that when the apartment leaves the factory, it is never opened again until you pull off the shrink wrap when someone is moving in. Completely done. Um, so uh, we had two teams working on it, a team doing it in conventional and a team doing it in modular. Um, we, here's all the way the plumbing and the air conditioning work. This is what they would look like from the street with this sort of relief on the buildings and the kind of, again, retail all along the bottom. And the modular one. And from inside the apartments, the only thing that you would notice that this wasn't built in a conventional way is that this wall is eight inches thick, and, or about nine inches thick, instead of typical five and three quarters. Because that's where the mate line of the two steel pieces come together. So this is, a one bedroom would be made out of two boxes, and a two bedroom out of three boxes, and so on. But you could even get rid of the wall in the middle if you want to. Um, so anyway, I think that between being an architect, being a designer, caring about aesthetics, caring about thinking, it, you know, it, it was really about expanding the territories of architects, how architects practice, what they think about, how they can use their skill sets to do lots of different things. So whether that's some of the development projects we've done, some of the construction that we've done, some of the software that we're working on, we're working on a new software that could help you learn how to um, figure out your massing of buildings and determine where to actually build buildings. This, this software that we've developed, Envelope, allows you to mass your buildings. This is something that takes like an architect and, a, and a, a zoning attorney four to six hours to do. You can now zone, you can actually mass any building in less than 60 seconds on a web-based portal. So we're looking for our last tranche of uh, funding to get this to market. But to really think, you know, architecture has given away so much of its territory in the last 50 years. You know, there, there's a, but we believe that it's the technology, the paradigm shift, this is a time to return to being the master builder. That what architects are good at is that we are not great specialists, but we are fantastic generalists. We know a lot about a lot of different things. And if we keep forcing ourselves into just being specialists and making the aesthetics of a building, we are making a huge mistake. That if we can grab back all these kinds of territories, we can really offer a way to make denser, better, higher quality buildings that are more sustainable. Density equals sustainability, right? Forget about the fact that putting photovoltaics on your house or whatever it might be is a green thing. Putting a solar panel on a McMansion is a bad idea, right? But building incredibly dense cities that have great public space and great quality of life and a mixture of live, work, and play, that is a sustainable, and then leaving the rest of the land open as natural space that is a sustainable idea. And if we can't get control of all these things, we're going to make some grave mistakes in the way that we continue to invest our infrastructure dollars in the future and put ourselves in a really bad spot. I'm not going to talk about this. But anyway, I think that the important thing that I want you to take away from is that we're not calling for a new style or a new period or a new, a new anything except for a new attitude for how we can practice and the kinds of things that we should be looking at and investing in to think about technology, to think about politics, to think about the finance, and that all of those things actually support the art and I believe drive the art further forward. So if you're willing to take those risks, and I believe that every architect should because it's the only way we're gonna change the kind of cities and environments we live in, but by doing that, it's possible to go from this to this to this in 10 years flat. Thank you very much. They are. They are all individual companies. Much to our uh, accountants and attorneys' pleasure, and much to our displeasure, but they are all separate companies. Probably your insurance company's pleasure. Yeah, exactly. No, no. Oh, sorry. Did you? I just wanted to ask you, if you went to graduate school in architecture, what would you do before that? Um, I was an investment banker, and not a very good one. <laughs> So this is a, a 
fantastic revolution in thinking. Do you assess people coming into the company on the basis of their the flexibility of their thought more than on their say country skills? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And and having uh, like multiple skill sets, you know, someone who could sculpt and write code. That's that's the kind of person we like. And 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 also attitude, you know. Teaching, I mean, we all teach, we love teaching, it's a huge part of the office, it's a huge part of the research. It's also the best 15-week interview you could ever have, right? And you really see how people act under pressure, and a big part of who we like to come and bring to shop are people who have those varied skill sets, but are also just nice people and team players. Like, it really makes a difference when you're battling through things like this. That's a great fitness function for Thanks, Helen. It's felt like I've been, we've all been in a maze, blindfolded, and, you know, spun around, and, like, we're really, you know, it's, the day-to-day -day battles are, are tough, and talking to, you know, the construction, but, you know, but the, the one thing I will say is, you know, 10 years ago, we were having these arguments with the construction industry, and now things that were, they told us we were crazy then, are now standard practice. And, and that's why I think the modular high-rise for, for housing is really, I think, is the next thing. Because we can't keep building buildings as one-off prototypes. It's ridiculous. And um, the one thing that I think is a problem with it is that people think modular prefab equals low cost, low quality, double wides, like, well, I don't know, whatever that comes into their heads. But we're just talking about assigning you know, production line techniques, you know, to, to buildings, right? And you can build a Kia on a production line and you can build a Rolls Royce on a production line. It's, it's, it, you can build anything you want, whatever you want to do. So in the end, I think that the cost savings, I think the safety for the workers, I think a lot of things are going to actually raise the level of architecture and design that can be accomplished by doing that, as opposed to everything being a one-off. So, so I hope in 10 years you tell me that we were right. Okay. Th thank you very, very much. Oh, you know, I can't pass up an opportunity to thank people, Greg and your lovely wife. But it was, uh, what, 10 years ago you were here? And what I witnessed tonight is that anything is possible for Nashville. We are creative, intelligent, smart, stick-together community, and we have this river that 10 years ago nobody even knew was here. I'm a native Nashvilleian, and I think anything's possible. And uh, Greg, I thank you for uh, letting me see that again. My brother Stephen saw that, and he was smarter than me, but I'm going to get to implement it with my sister Linda and Matthew. So thank you very much, and thank you, Civic Design Center. And this space might not be the best meeting space, but it's here. <laughs> Again, inspired. Like that was a wonderful lecture. It kept everyone here moving after. Thank you, Greg, and thank you all for coming. And look forward to more events in the future with this uh, lecture series and obviously this space uh, as it continues to evolve. And again, thank you. Good night. <laughs>